All right, so the recording is live. Um, thank you uh, so much, all of you, for joining this evening for um, this event. This is a producer-consumer, so we're looking at the producer-consumer um, design pattern as part of an event series, um, hopefully, a new event series for Women Who Code San Francisco called Design Patterns. And we'll talk a little bit uh, about producer consumer and we'll talk a little bit about what design patterns actually are. Um, but first, let me kind of introduce Women Who Code for anyone who's new to the organization. So Women Who Code is a not-for-profit um, and our mission is to inspire women to excel in technology careers. We envision a world where women are proportionately represented as technical leaders, executives, founders, VCs, board members, and software engineers. So for tonight, this particular event, um, I'll be your host. My name is Jenny Kwan. And um, we also have two volunteers um, co-hosting this event, Monica and Archana. If you have any uh, questions, issues, concerns, please feel free to reach out directly to them via text, uh, via chat. Um, and um, we'll make sure that um, everyone is, is taken care of. We do have a code of conduct and um, that code of contact was actually posted on uh, the meetup event. But um, I guess uh, I won't go too deeply into it. Basically, um, behave as you would in a professional environment and, um, you know, no, no bigotry. <laughs> um, okay, so let's kind of get into um, the, the content. So when we say design patterns, so I'm going to share my screen and, um, and I just want to make sure that everyone can actually see that. So uh, design patterns. I, I want to kind of like share a little uh, personal story. So um, about me, my name is, is uh, as I said, Jenny Kwan. I am the chief technology officer of a very small um, technology startup uh, called Woodlamp Technologies. And I've been doing engineering for about um, 20 years at this point, uh, a blend of engineering and data. Um, and, you know, I started off as an analyst. I did not have a formal computer science education. And so, what really kind of accelerated my career as a software engineer um, is going from, you know, write, trying to write code to solve individual problems, like basically like complete tickets, right? You know, we had JIRA back then too. Um, and go from that towards a more holistic, high level, top down architectural thinking of, of software. And, for me at the time, this notion of design patterns was that gateway, right? So what is a design pattern? Why is it important that we talk about this stuff? Well, the definition of the term formally is in software engineering, a software design pattern is a general reusable solution to a commonly occurring problem within a given context in software design. It is not a finished design that can be transformed directly into source or machine code, rather is a description or template for how to solve a problem that can be used in many different situations. Now, that text seems quite loose, but the words in it within software engineering actually are very precise. So when we say context, that actually means something. When we say problem, that's a, actually a formal term. And when we say solution, that's also a formal term, right? And what if there's any takeaway from this evening, it's to think about software design problems. Now, when I say design, I don't mean in terms of UI UX, right? I mean like design of systems, um, what does what the backends look like? What does front end activity look like? How do they communicate with each other? What are the behavioral patterns of these uh, parts? When we think about those designs, there's actually a formal language. And so I'm going to use the producer consumer as um, a uh, example of that. In producer consumer, we actually think about 
three parts to any design uh, question. And those three parts are the problem you're trying to solve, which is supposed to be a very high level generic statement. The context, the context is the thing that actually makes it um, specific to a particular situation. And the combination of the problem and the context point at a solution. You can't just say, I have a problem, this is always the solution. That is completely incorrect. And if you run into seniors and architects who um, are prescriptive about software design in that way, they don't know what they're talking about. I will say that again, as a super senior, as a 20 year person, if you come across a senior who says, there's only one way to solve a particular problem, they're wrong. They're not using the context word. Context is so key. It's actually the combination of a problem and context. Most people, um, when they are prescriptive in that way, that's because they have a long career where over 10 years, they've only ever seen one context and they take the context for granted. I, you know, ideally, engineers jump around in their careers and see a lot of different contexts. That's how you really learn, but we're not gonna go there. All right, so what is the problem that we're trying to solve with producer consumer? It's two problems. The first one that I have listed here is actually a less important problem. So I'm going to start with the second one. So when we have a system that provides a service, right, it's going to perform work when you request work. So think about like you're mailing a package. That's a service, right? You go to the um, post office of whatever country you, you happen to be in, however that's managed, right? whether it's state funded or not. Um, and you hand over the package and you hand over a sum of money and ideally they're going to send it somewhere, right? They're gonna send it to the right, to the right place. Um, the problem within that framework where someone is pr providing a service is how do you guarantee latency when demand for the service is spiky. That's the problem. The problem is when the post office is flooded with packages, how do you still guarantee us an SLA, a service level agreement? Now the service level agreement doesn't necessarily mean like, oh, we're swamped with packages. We're still going to get everything out in two days, right? It might not mean that. It might just mean like, hey, if it doesn't get out in two days, I guarantee that I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give you some warning the day before that your package is not going to arrive there in time. That might be the agreement, right? But there is some agreement you're trying to adhere to, right? And how do you actually adhere to that agreement when your system is swamped? That's one problem. The second problem is think of it this way. In the days before online tracking of packages, internet, right? You didn't have transparency. You handed over the package. You had no idea where it was. You didn't know how long it would take to get there. Not, obviously the world has moved on, right? And, and actually, let me dial that back. It depends on the postal service. I don't wanna be US centric. It depends on the postal service. It depends on the service that you use, right? But sometimes there is no transparency. So the second related problem is when you have high latency, so when the idea is if it's short latency, like, okay, I hand over the package, it's going to arrive instantaneously, and I just know that, right? Obviously, I don't care about the transparency, I just know it's gonna get there, right? It's only if I expect it's going to take a week, and then over the course of the week, I wanna check on it, right? So when there's high latency, how do I actually ensure transparency? Those are the two problems that we're trying to solve. They're very generic problems. And this is where we actually have to inject context because the context is that we're talking about a system that performs work. What do we mean by the word work? Work 
has a specific computer science definition. And that's computer science definition is that it is a ta it is some task that's going to side effect your system. It's going to change something about your system. Right. So what I mean by that is um, if I uh, have, let's say, money handed over, that money is going to go into the cash register. That is a change in the state of the cash register. Right. Why is this important? Because there are systems that do not perform work, not by this definition. When you have a database query that just tells you what's inside of it, it's doing the query, that query does not change the data. So this problem of transparency and latency, SLA, they still apply to database systems, but you would not solve this with producer consumer because the context is that it only applies to systems that do work. And a read-only database query, something that just like tells, calculates some information and tells you, does not change the data. That's not a system that, that performs work and you would not use producer consumer for that. So again, even if you don't learn anything about con producer consumer, the big takeaway is, for design, there's always three pieces, a generic problem statement, a context, and then based on the combination of those two things, they point to a solution. Now, I want to go back. Actually, let me go through this solution statement. The solution is we're going to somehow decouple the acknowledgement of work requests from the execution response to those requests. When we say decouple, the, the classic real world analog is actually, I'm gonna give you a receipt. So um, you give me a package at the post office and I give you a receipt for that package. That receipt is my acknowledgement that you gave me a package, right? Now you have something that you can hang on to that holds a piece of information that you can then use to say later on, hey, where's my package? Here's my package ID. Here's my package number, right? because I gave you an acknowledgement. The acknowledgement is the receipt. So I'm gonna decouple the acknowledgement. I'm basically going to say, I'll give you the acknowledgement now, and I'm gonna do the work later. That's the entire solution. The entire solution is just that I'm going to decouple those two things. And if I de decouple those two things and give you a way to A, have transparency so that you can look it up based on the information on the receipt. And B, that um, I have some way based on the receipt to notify you if I'm not gonna make the SLA, either I fail, like I'm gonna tell you like, hey, I'm just returning the package to you, right? But there's some communication, right? But it's all predicated on the receipt. That's it. Now you can see, based on that solution statement, it is way too generic to be turned into code, which is this sentence. It is not a finished design that can be transformed directly into source and machine code. That's a design pattern. There's a difference between a design pattern and a design. A design pattern is to say bridge. Well, you should put a bridge there. <laughs> That's a design pattern. A bridge is how you get from A to B. You're going to span something across the body of something. Maybe it's rocks, maybe it's water, right? That's a design pattern. But a design is the specific design of the specific bridge that you're going to put in that specific location. And we as humans, we as software engineers who are making architectural decisions have to actually look at the design pattern and say like, hey, there's some well-worn research here to say like, hey, this design pattern is a good pattern and this is how it behaves in different ways, right? And based on that, I'm gonna translate that into an actual design that I'm, go I'm gonna put into code. Does that all make sense? I'm gonna pause for a sec and, and ask for questions.
All right. Well, then, um, the let's go into a specific design. So this solution statement, I'm going to decouple somehow. It's means nothing really like what what do i do with that what does it mean to decouple well in computer science terms it implies two things one is that i'm i'm doing asynchronous uh execution and response so um asynchronous because the unit of work is being performed on a different schedule than the receipt of work I receive the unit of work, I'm gonna do the work later. They're on different timing schedules. So by definition, they're asynchronous, right? The second is that these receipts I hand out, I actually have to store a copy somewhere in some central state store. That's the second point, right? Now, given those characteristics, what's a design pattern for that? Well, one design pattern is I'm gonna take the state store and say like, well, what kind of state store? Well, why do we use a queue? That's good for a lot of um, that's good for a lot of situations because most situations we want to do first in first out. If you're the first person to give me a package at the post office, I should send that first, right? It's kind of like a fairness issue, right? And most services are predicated on this fairness principle: whoever comes first gets served first, right? So. Given that, queue is actually a really good choice for that because queues are first in, first out data structures. So now we have something more concrete. I can say, okay, what's my state store of requests? It's a queue. I also say then that there are these things called producers and consumers. And what are they? They're actual threads of execution. And thread has a, com has a computer science um, definition. So this process. Right. So, but I have these threads of execution that are responsible. The producer is going to receive the request for work and it's going to acknowledge it. It's going to put it in the queue and then acknowledge it back right away. So the producer is really in charge of acknowledgement. It's in charge of handing out receipts. The consumer of the queue is going to take these work item requests and actually do them. Right. Now, what are some properties of this? Well, we're assuming that all of this stuff is in process and in user space. What does that mean? Because again, we're, we have to be really specific in terms of um, software architecture. Now, I want to be clear. Software engineering is an engineering discipline, which means that it's not a philosophy and it's not a science. They're two different things. Those are all three different things, right? In order to do engineering, we need the philosophy and we also need the science. What do I mean about philosophy and science? The philosophy is the pure math of it. That's what, when we say computer science, that's a terrible term. Computer science is not a science. There's no, nothing empirical about it. You're not going out and sampling, you know, different hard disks and then doing statistical distributions of the things the way that a biologist tags butterflies. That's a science, right? Science implies statistics. It's empiricism. Right, so computer science is a math. Math is pure, it's, ph it's philosophy. We need to learn the philosophy stuff, but we also need to learn the, um, we also need to learn the science pieces of it. And the science pieces of it are, um, what are the actual properties of, let's say, transistors in silicon, right? How do registers work? What is an L2 cache? What is an operating system? How does operating, how do operating systems ensure security? What is the difference between kernel space and user space? Those are all things that are in the realm of science, even though they're built up by humans, they're in the realm of science because you can actually study those, um, the properties of those things because they're actually implemented on real world things, right? It's not the same as, an, as a uh, philosophy. Now, when I say in process, that's part of the science of software engineering. What the hell is a process? Well, operating systems have basically arrived at a way of executing arbitrary programs, right? So 
you come along, you've written up a piece of code, it's an executable that you can load into memory and run, right? But decades ago, people figured out it's a really bad idea to give everyone root access. So you need to actually like provide some security bounds, right? And then just for safety, right? You want to make sure that if you have a bug in your program, it's not going to crash any other program that's running on the operating system. So the way to do that is this thing called a process. It's a sandbox. You get a sandbox with your own universe of memory and your own universe of CPU. And you can't affect anything outside of it. If you need access to a resource that is outside of the sandbox, you have to ask for permission. And that's what user space means, right? Now, in the architecture, implicit is Q is something you can implement in code. And so it's in user space. You're not putting the Q in the operating system. You're putting it in your own software, right? Same with these producer and consumer threads. So assuming you're here, I'll give you some examples of, of other ways that you could do this. Let's say you had a messaging service like RabbitMQ and you use that as your queue. Well, it, that's by definition out of process. You have to actually make a network call into that service. When you download something from the internet, you're leaving your sandbox by definition. And it's actually really important as you progress in your career as a software engineer to like understand these distinctions. So here we are, we have a solution that is good for in process and in user space, great. You have, as I said, an opportunity for immediate acknowledgement, which means you get the receipt right away, which is great. You have a fairness principle built in, which means first in, first out, the first request gets served first, great. There's no built-in ability to return value. So this is, here's the thing. The consumer picks up the unit of work, right? And then executes the work. When it's done, how does it tell the person who requested it that it's done? Well, the person who requested it talked to the producer. So if you need to actually um, implement that, it's up to you to design the producer to record the, uh, requester details into the ticket that you put in the queue. It's up on you, it's, a, it's upon you as a programmer to do that. This design does not implicitly have that. And then it's up to you to code the consumer to be able to read that ticket and say like, oh, hey, here's the phone number or address or email address of the person who requested the work, I can now go contact them, right? It's up on you to do that. It is not, built into the producer consumer design. So we need to know that. We also need to know that there's no built-in transparency. Yes, you have this queue, but in order for someone to actually take their ticket, the receipt, excuse me, the receipt, and actually come to you and say like, hey, where's my package? In order for you to do that, you actually have to have a dedicated thread that is reading the queue to be able to respond to that. So there's nothing built into this design. All of the information is in the queue, but there's no way to read it yet. So it's upon you to, to implement that. And also there's no resilience for queue because it's in process. What happens if your machine crashes or if your program crashes, the contents of the queue go away because it's in main memory, right? This is where it, you potentially have a lot of value to say like the producer writes to a database and then the consumer reads from the database. Now you've modified the design, but in modifying that design, it's not a software, it's not a software memory queue anymore. It's something that's stored in a database or in a, in a persistent um, message queue service like RabbitMQ, right? Um, that if you do that, you are no longer purely in user space. And now you have to deal with all of the things of like, what happens if the network goes down, if, if I'm trying to fetch from that queue, right? All of those questions, like you need to actually figure out. As you progress in your career, this is the thing to really 
um, look at, like when you're making these design decisions is take a look at the design patterns. Think of how you would translate the design patterns into actual designs. So now here's a design, here's a queue. You can write this. This is fairly straightforward. We'll go into actual code in a minute. We do have code in three languages that we're going to compare and contrast, hopefully this evening. We'll see. Um, but we do have three languages. But the idea is that you're going to um, be able to implement this thing, but you need to be mindful. And this is where engineering as an actual discipline, where you know people write stuff down and, and it's peer reviewed and there's like notes. <laughs> this is one of, one of my big gripes about software engineering actually is that um, the uh, literature around software engineering is very light relative to let's say data science. Right? Data science actually has mathematical proofs behind everything and there's like academia, right? There's research papers you can read, it's great. But we don't have that in software engineering, boohoo. And based on that, you kind of have to do some digging to actually say like, hey, I have a design. What are the limitations of the design? In what context can I actually apply the design? How does the design behave? Am I thinking about things like crashes? Am I thinking about things like the machine is swamped? Right? Okay. Let's look at some code then. Oh, actually, I'm going to pause again. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Can I ask a question actually? Go ahead. <laughs> Is first in first out built into the design pattern or that's part of an implementation? Because I'm just thinking maybe it would be in some scenario better to process the quicker are expected to be quicker results first, like with the parcel analogy, if your parcel is only going, you know, the next down the block versus across the country. Yeah. So um, the first thing first out is um, the first thing first out is not built into the design pattern. It is built into this design. So let's actually go back. Uh, the design pattern simply says, so the solution of the design pattern is I'm going to decouple. Okay, I'll decouple, great. And um, implicit there is some state store of requests. There's nothing in here that says what kind of state store. So that's the design pattern. Now, in this specific design, I choose to use a queue. With a queue, it is first in, first out. Now, if I could, if I wanted to, I could actually change this to a priority queue, right? And then that's a twist on, that's actually a different design for this design pattern, right? Um, so yes, we can, we can vary, but implicit in the notion of I'm going to choose a queue data structure for my uh, state store of requests, it's first in, first out. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, there's a question in the chat. Um, can you give some more information about RabbitMQ? So RabbitMQ is a message queue service um, that provides many different modes of operation. Um, but in essence, it's a place where you can um, over network. So you establish a T TCP connection to the thing, to, to a socket on the thing. And you say like, I'm, I want to send this message, right? And the idea of RabbitMQ is it decouples the sender from the receiver. So basically like, um, I'm going to throw a message in a bottle and anyone can pick this up, kind of. Like uh, a practical, a very practical way of thinking about this is I have a unit of work here. I know there's a pool of workers. I don't know who the hell you are. The, in, the invisible Grubhub, let's call it. <laughs> the invisible Grubhub, the invisible thankless Grubhub. Um, for those of you who are not in a U.S. metropolitan area, the Grubhub is a food delivery service here. Anyway, um, if I uh, don't care who, RabbitMQ al allows that abstraction where I can throw the message on there and then anyone who is subscribed to receiving messages of that type will then receive the message. 
So it's very conducive to something like producer consumer where all of the consumers would subscribe to RabbitMQ and say like, hey, when work comes in that matches this description, give it to me, right? And the producers don't have to know who all the consumers are. You can think of this as a solution to an N by M problem, right? Without the queue, the producer would then have to check each consumer directly. So A, it has to know about them, which is actually a pain in the butt because sometimes they crash. And then now the producer needs logic for dealing with crashes of consumers. Boo, don't like that. So by inserting this thing in the middle, it's N to one, one to M, right? So that's one characteristic of that design. Um, the fault tolerance piece kind of falls out of that because like if some, if a consumer, um, let's say crashes after receiving uh, a message and doesn't tell RabbitMQ like, hey, I actually did fulfill this task. RabbitMQ is designed to then say, oh, hey, it's been five minutes and this consumer that took a message from me still hasn't come back to say it's done. I expected it to have been done in one minute. I'm going to now take that message and deliver it to somebody else. I'm going to assume that the one who hasn't responded in five minutes, that somehow something happened. It got into an accident. Does that make sense? Is that, is that a decent enough overview of, of RabbitMQ for now? Okay. There's, there's one question, um, I guess, to, <laughs> to follow on that topic. Uh, what is a better messaging system, uh, Kafka or RabbitMQ? Um, as a messaging system, RabbitMQ. There are uh, different and overlapping use cases for Kafka. What Kafka really um, is good for is a uh, stable replay. So um, you can always go back seven days even by default and actually say like, hey, replay all of the messages from seven days ago up till now. So it's usually more used in um, a context where you have to guarantee that your messages are really well persisted. And the trade-off for that is that in Kafka, you can't do any message reordering. That's part of the uh, architecture of Kafka to be able to give you performance, right? RabbitMQ can do message reordering. So it really depends on your specific use case. It's actually way more um, nuanced than um, a lot of the vendor literature would imply. Is that a good? OK. <laughs> um, cool. So perfect. Let's look at some, some Python. Uh, let's see here. And oh, I'm sitting in darkness. I need to, I am sitting in darkness. Let me go turn a light on. Hold on one sec. <laughs> Okay, cool. So I put together three um, Repolit repos, which um, the links are in the meetup. You are all free to come and, and actually follow along in the Repolit, which, which I highly encourage. But this is the Python solution. Cool. Okay. So excited. All right. So I'm going to start at the bottom, as you normally do with Python. So here's the main, right? So I abstracted a main. And you can see what I create is something called a scenario object. So the scenario is the container for the simulation. I'm simulating a producer-consumer queue interaction. This is, I'm calling a uh, scenario. So what are these arguments? Three, five, and seven. So I'm going to say three, five, and seven. Where is it? Where's the init? Here we go. Producers len, consumers len, and producer messages len. The number of conduce, producers, so I'm going to say there's three producers. I'm going to say there's five consumers. 
And I'm going to say that each of the producers, for the purpose of the simulation, is going to generate seven units of work. So 21 units of work total to be consumed by the five consumers. If I run this, so I'll run this first, you can see that, um, what am I doing? I take the three producers, you can see I have these, well, first the, the system starts and I printed out that message. And then I'm going to start the three producers that, this is all um, asynchronous, by the way, so it doesn't necessarily happen in this order every time. This is the order it happened to happen in this time, right? So here's the producer. Uh, and we have three that start. We also have the five consumers start. And then at that point, the system bows out and says like, hey, I started the producers and the consumers. I'm out. Drop the mic. Right? Okay. Then here's the messages as they are consumed. And you can see I popped a bunch of messages on here where each message is tagged with the producer ID of the producer that uh, generated it, as well as the message ID, zero through six, because seven messages, messages total, of the, um, cons of the um, producer, right? And you can see when the producer is done, so here's producer zero, producer zero, generated all uh, seven messages and it bowed out. It was like, hey, I'm done generating messages, drop the mic. Um, where are the consumption messages? <laughs> I swear this was working when I last checked. Oh, well. the idea of the simulation is that we're going to um, all of the consumers when they're uh, done, they end. And they don't end. Actually, the program hangs. And that's because the system, the scenario object, has no way of knowing when the consumers are done um, fetching or processing all the units of work. And we'll get into that. So that's why the program actually hangs right now. But you can see all of the messages have been consumed. There's, you can count them, but there's 21 of them here, right? So this is the working simulation. The orders are non-deterministic, as you would expect. Right? They're loosely ordered because they're first in, first out. But the producers don't necessarily like just cycle through, you know, zero through zero one two zero one two zero one two. No, they're just like racing to get in there. So it's um, non-deterministic. It's still first in, first out. But they're all here. And now let's look at this code. Okay, so here's the scenario. And how does the scenario object actually bootstrap and work? Well, I have to instantiate the scenario object and then I have to call start on it. And so you can see the instantiation is I create the queue. And then I create all of these producer threads. So here's the three producer threads that actually get created. And you can see in the constructor for the producer thread, which I'm calling producer callable. This is one of those artifacts. So this is where when, when a design meets an actual programming language in a set of libraries, right? You have to kind of contort it to fit what that programming language looks like and what that programming language is um, built-in standard library, as well as third-party libraries, what they look like. In this case, the way you create a thread in Python is to call thread, which is a constructor, it's an object, with something that is callable. Usually it's a function, functions are callable, but you can create classes that are callable with a uh, double underscore method call. So now you can use this object as a function. I bet you didn't know that. <laughs> Python is fun that way. Okay, so given that, right, 
I instantiate this callable, but I have to pass the queue in. And why am I passing the queue into the callable? That's because the queue is shared between all of the producers and all of the consumers. They don't have their own queue. And so I have to pass it in. I have to create the object outside of the producers and the consumers. And then I have to hand it to each of them as they're created, a reference to it, right? Same with these consumer threads. So during the init, this is all that happens. The simulation hasn't started yet, but I've instantiated all the objects. Everything, everything is live, they're all waiting, right? Then when I call start on this guy, I cycle through, so you'll see I have these print messages. We'll talk about this print lock later. I cycle through all of the producer threads and I call start. I cycle through the consumer threads and I call start. And all I'm doing is just printing to say like, hey, you called start on me. That was the beginning of the call and that's the end of the call. So I have something to look at, right? These kinds of debug messages are actually, um, whenever I program in Python, I, I require myself and my teams to um, have uh, decorators that do this stuff, by the way, because it makes debugging way easier because you can just see it automatically, right? Here, I've done it manually. I'm not using a decorator. Okay, so. Jenny, uh, sorry. Yes. There's a Go question um, in the chat. Can you briefly explain what a thread does? Yes, a thread is a... <laughs> So earlier I used the term process. Process um, within the realm of uh, the science of software engineering, which is you know, within the realm of operating systems has a very specific definition. Like it's your sandbox and all that stuff. But over in the philosophy side, computer science, process has a different meaning. This is a common gotcha. When you read literature, you need to know which side they're talking about, by the way, okay? So if you're talking about computer science, what a process is, is a sequential set of steps. That's it, that's a process, right? A thread is an implementation of a computer science process, a sequential series of steps within an operating system that has processes. So you'll often hear this thing of a POSIX thread. POSIX is a Unix standard, right? So within Linux or Unix, The operating system has a facility for you to request the creation of a thread, which allows multiple um, sequential processes, computer science processes, multiple sequential processes to coexist within the same operating system process. And they're going to all go at the same time, subject to the operating system's scheduler. The scheduler is the thing that actually controls which of those threads is actually being worked on by a CPU or core on a CPU. I mean, and nowadays, like all CPUs have, are multi-core, right? But the operating system is the one who doles out access to CPU to every thread. But on the philosophy side, a thread is just a process, which is a sequential series of steps right? That's implemented in the science side um, inside of an operating system process as a way to have multiple threads at once for a process to be multi-threaded. Does that, is that a good enough explanation for now? <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm wondering, <clears throat> like, isn't like everything already automatically a thread? Like even if you like how the computer processes stuff <clears throat> and underneath like even a few, it's a difference well, between like, specifying it as a thread or instantiating it as a thread. As opposed so, to doing the producer callable on its own. Yeah, there's, there's two pieces. It's not just the saying that um, it's a sequential series of steps. It's that it's subject to a scheduler. So the scheduler is the thing that's going to say like, hey, you go now, then you go, then you go. So you have the option for it to be 
um, parallel. By default, if you don't use threading, right, or unless you implement your own scheduler, which a lot of languages do, if you don't use threading by default, everything in a single process, operating system process, is sequential and there's no parallelism. Okay, so it's for, yeah, it's to make it parallel. Better. Yes, it's to allow <laughs> parallelism. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but I actually, no, no, no. I want to I wanna dial back from that. People, people use that term a lot, parallel. Um, you know, back in the day, there was a time in which, um, there was a time in which uh, computers were a single core and you only had one CPU, right? Um, desktop computers had that. And yet you had UIs, right? You could point and click things like that, like think like Windows 3.1 or Windows 95 or something like that, right? Way back when, right? I'm, I'm a throwback, so, you know. But in those days, you didn't have any parallelism because there were not multiple cores. And yet you had threads because the threads allow for something called time slicing so that you could actually interrupt between things. So that when I click on a stop button on a, on something in Windows 3.1, which would have been on a single CPU, single core machine, right? That stop button, that message would be picked up and acknowledged and actually acted upon. It would actually interrupt the other process. And that wasn't parallel. So threads are for more than just parallelism. It's really um, anything that you would want to use a thread scheduler for which so includes kind of, things like interrupting. <clears throat> so it's kind of a way to like keep track, keep track of the process. Yes. Um, interact with it. Keep track with it, interact with it, and, and oftentimes ensure fairness because there are um, certain threads that are really computationally heavy and others that are not, and they soak up all of the resources and the scheduler is going to be like, hey, hey, wait a minute, you've been eating a lot. We're gonna make sure that this guy gets a meal, you know? Yeah. So, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. So what do these callables do? What's the producer callable do? Well, the producer, it instantiates with the mess producer ID, the um, number of messages it's going to produce in a reference to the queue, a pointer, let's say. Although it's not really a pointer, it's a reference. Pointer exists in, is only really relevant in C and C++. Reference is a uh, philosophical computer science concept to, you know, how do you actually maintain a reference to something? So they operate in different spaces. Okay, so um, we just, instantiate the callable with um, copying everything into itself, great. When you call it though, you can see that all the producer does is loop over the message IDs. It's gonna wait a quarter second between each one and it's gonna put it in the queue, that's it. So the producer is really straightforward. The consumer is really straightforward too. So the consumer instantiates with the consumer ID in a reference to the queue, right? And it's just going to loop forever. This is why the program hangs. It's gonna loop forever. Um, and it's going to try to get something from the queue, if the queue is empty, which here's the thing to keep in mind, the queue could be empty before the end. If the consumers are really aggressive, it could empty the queue before the producer has the chance to fill it up again, right? This is why we wait forever in this architecture. We can't know just because the queue is empty, that the, that the consumers are done. There may be another message coming from a producer 
There's no, um, nothing synchronizing the two sides. And because there's nothing synchronizing the two sides, which gives you a, kind of like a foreshadowing in terms of what we'll be looking at next with the other programming languages, we're going to talk about that communication layer. How do we, how do we um, communicate doneness, right? So here, there's no way to communicate doneness because we don't know just because the queue is empty that it's done. Okay, so we're going to do a try. We're going to get it and then we're going to just print it. That's it. And you can see after this forever loop, I put in this line that says like, hey, print that I'm ended, which never gets printed, right? This code is never reached because it's stuck in this loop right now the program i should probably stop it uh how do i stop this you'll see the program would be looping and it would try to get something from the queue it would fail and then fall through to this um queue empty exception and then it would pass which means it would loop again right so this is the code in its entirety. It seems pretty simple. It is pretty simple. Python makes it really simple. But we're going to take an opportunity to like peel this back. But as of right now, does anyone have any questions on this code? OK. So. The let us then go. I'm going to close this Python window and I'm going to open up the Java one. So here's the thing. The Python standard library is really nice to us. It takes care of a lot of details that you actually have to think about when you um, are coordinating access to a shared resource. There's actually a term for that. How do you coordinate access to a shared resource? It's called concurrency. Okay, so to really, especially when you uh, step into a, an environment that's more demanding in terms of performance, in terms of resource utilization, if you write that kind of software, like, you know, I had spent a year working on a database kernel, right? Um, when you're in that kind of environment, then every clock cycle really matters. And at that point, you throw away something like, Java, like, like Python. You, can't, you just can't use it, right? It's way too slow. It's way too slow. It's way too resource um, sloppy, right? And, and that's OK, by the way. When you have plenty of resource, you can be sloppy. You can afford to be. It's actually more important to optimize for programmer productivity, right? But there's other applications where programmer productivity takes a back seat to machine efficiency. Right, so in that context, let's take a look at the Java. Um, the Java code, where is it? There it is. Okay, so here's the main class. And the main class I'm instantiating a main object with the same arguments, three, five, and seven. Oh, actually, I'm going to run this first. Da, 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 da. Uh, Jenny, while it runs, there is a question in the chat. Um, where do you use this pattern? I'm not sure if it's asking in the abstract or. Yeah, actually, could you um, clarify what you mean by where? Maybe we can come back to that um, when she responds. Okay, cool. Um, here's um, like, yeah. Let me let me at least address it in the abstract. Let me address it in the abstract. So um, 
it comes back to those two. Here's the problem. How do you, how do you provide transparency and then how do you ensure some sort of latency SLA when uh, things are bursty? So it presumes, of course, that you have um, requests for work that are bursty, which means that you know, sometimes you go an hour without getting a single request, sometimes you get slammed right, inside of five minutes. So that's the burstiness. And the burstiness has to somehow present some sort of problem. That's very abstract. And here's, here's the thing that I um, will say, um, studying design patterns um, before you've encountered the real world corresponding problem is kind of like, eh, you know? This is a very common one, right? There's a lot of systems that have to use producer-consumer, which is why it's talked about a lot. Sometimes it's the subject of interview questions, right? But it does kind of like behoove you to actually go. I, when I study this stuff, I actually go down and hunt out, you know, specific implementations of these things and actually look at like, hey, where is it being used? Why is it being used? What are the characteristics? And actually understand that myself. It's very difficult to communicate that. This is the... I don't know. I don't want to be too, um, I don't want to be weird about it there, but there is a thing of like part of, part of the value of senior is just that you've seen shit. That's it. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me go back to the replit. So you can see here, it runs, right? And it actually stops. So that's, that's an improvement. <laughs> it actually ends. It doesn't just stick. Okay. And let's take a look at this. We have here a Instantiation of main and then a run, exactly the same pattern as the, the Python code. The instantiation looks like this. So because it's Java and Java is a pain in the butt, I have to declare all of my member variables up front. So here I've declared, this is where I'm holding my queue, this is how I'm holding my threads. And um, I have to uh, actually, this is how I'm messaging between the producers and consumers in terms of um, when we're done producing messages. Okay. And this constructor for the main class, all it does is instantiate those things. Sim exactly the same as the Python code. Right. You can see, though, that one of the ways in which um, I love that Java shoves this in your face great. The variable type for the queue is queue, but what I'm using for the queue is a linked list because linked list is a concrete data type that implements the interface queue, which is an abstract data type, if that makes sense. Um, that division between abstract and data uh, abstract data types and concrete data types we're not going to talk about today, but it's good to be mindful of that. No matter what programming language you're in. Okay, and similarly, you can see it's a list, but what kind of list is it? Oh, it's an array list. Abstract versus concrete. You should look it up. Okay, so it instantiates it, and then when you hit run it does this thing where it starts the threads, right? And then it waits. So these producer threads actually get what? How are they instantiated? The producer thread is instantiated with the queue, but it's also instantiated with the reference to this thing, an array 
of size one of how many producers are running. The idea is that when the producer is done, it's going to decrement this thing. And when this hits zero, that's how the system, the main class, knows that all producers are done and therefore can set this done variable to true, at which point the consumer, which has a reference to the done variable, can know that it can stop. That's it. But in order to do that safely, we have these crazy things that are synchronized. So what does it mean to synchronize? And this is where we actually start getting into some real computer science, right? When we, whenever we deal with concurrency, so let's define concurrency. Mm -hmm. Concurrency is a, prob is a solution to a problem. What is the problem? The problem is that you have something called um, a system that performs work where the execution may be interrupted to yield to executing other units of work or multiple units of work are being executed simultaneously. So both of these cases are covered. We have the interruption case and we have the parallelism case. Simultaneous work is called parallelism. However, one thing that is a quite a philosophical mind trip which I love. I love philosophical mind trips in computer science. When you interrupt a thread, it's a time freeze. Inside of that thread, nothing's happening, right? So the world is frozen. Therefore, interrupting for interleaving, we'll talk about what interleaving is, but whenever you interrupt, right, it's logically equivalent to parallelism, even if it's on the same CPU or it's on the same core even if it's not happening at the same time. Now, when we say time, what we mean is atomic decay time or astronomical time. So that's not logical philosophical time. Philosophical time is divorced from what the stars do and the planets do, and it's divorced from the half-life of cesium atoms, right? Something to think about as you get, um, when you think about ways in which to solve concurrency problems, because this is a very rich field, having a really solid philosophical grasp of what time is, is really key. But that's not today. Okay. So the individual units of work depend on the state of resources where the state may change or they may change the state of resources where the order of state change operations matters. That's a mouthful. What that means is that, um, I'll give you a for instance. I have a refrigerator. In the refrigerator, there are, I don't know, cans of a, carbonated beverage of your choice. I don't know where you live, whatever you drink. And someone checks the fridge and says like, hey, there's two cans left. I don't need to buy anymore. Leaves for the supermarket without buying, with the plan not to buy anymore. In the meantime, someone else, after this person has left for the supermarket, someone else comes to the fridge and drinks both cans. Inconsiderate. Oh my gosh. So when the person who went to the supermarket comes back, they're like, what the hell? There's, there's no cans of, of soda, right? Then I thought there were cans of soda. I didn't buy any. That is access to a shared resource. That's the refrigerator, right? And for that access of the shared resource, there was a delay between checking the refrigerator and going to buy something. That window creates an opportunity for conflict. 
And that is the basis for concurrency problems. That is what we call, I should say that is one of the basis for concurrency problems. That is what we call a dirty read. That's it. All right. I think I saw a question show up or a bunch. Yeah, I did say cesium. Okay. Yeah, the, the SI uh, standard for clocks is based on atomic decay of cesium. You should go to Paris and check it out. Don't, um, don't look at it without goggles. Okay. <laughs> so based on this scenario, this context, we have these problems. Interleaving reordering stuff leads to these things called lost updates, dirty reads, and incorrect summaries. That's the problem. And so the solution is you have to somehow coordinate access to shared resource. Now, this solution statement is useless. <laughs> coordinate what, how, what? It's useless. And that's why it's a design pattern, <laughs> right? It's like, oh, there's some coordination here. But there's actually some stuff that falls out of this. One is that resources are shared. So if you don't have resources being shared, you don't have concurrency. Parallelism without shared resources is not concurrency. That means that parallelism and, con and concurrency are not the same thing. A lot of people in literature even miss that distinction. It's a very key distinction. You can't have concurrency without shared resources. So what are then some actual designs that fall out? Well, we have mutex, we have semaphores, and we have monitors. And what is this synchronized keyword? It is Java's in-language implementation of a monitor. That's what synchronized is. And so let's talk about what this monitor looks like. So synchronize on what? On this object. So I'm synchronizing on this running count thing. Because basically the system is watching, it's waiting until this, um, until all the producers are done. So the running count needs to be zero. So if the running count is zero, it then does what? It sets this done variable to true, to signal to the consumers that it's done, right? So this, and otherwise, what is it going to do? It's going to wait. It's going to wait. The monitor provides this facility where you can wait on something. What does wait mean? It means the thread, this system thread is going to go to sleep. And it's going to wake up again when something calls notify on this. Now, what would call notify on this? It would be the producer, because the producer would say like, hey, I just decremented, because the producers don't know each other. All it knows is that it decremented, it did its job and said like, hey, minus one. So whenever it hits like, hey, minus one, it's going to notify on this. And then at that point, this thread gets put in a state to say like, hey, it's eligible to be run again. And then when the scheduler picks it up, the scheduler controls all threads. When the scheduler picks it up, this thread is going to then wake up and say like, oh, okay, wait, I'm gonna loop back because it's this while loop, I'm gonna loop back and check to see, is it zero now? You just did a minus one, is it zero now? Oh, it's not zero yet. Boom, wait again for the next producer to minus one. At some point, all the producers will have done their minus one. And then this will wake up, it'll hit this, it'll set to done, it'll break and then continue. Okay, so let's look at the producer. You can see how much code this is <laughs> for such a simple use case, right? Well, it's two reasons. One is Java is very verbose, which is good and bad. When you're a systems programmer, um, actually I shouldn't use that word because some people use systems programmer to mean operating systems. When you're a um, 
backend programmer that works on fault tolerant resilient services that are, have, need to be efficient. Let's say like those three things, right? Like when you're when you're that kind of backend programmer, right? You need to be very detail oriented about every byte. And so Java forces that, which is nice. Python, you wouldn't use, I mean, not only is Python slow itself, but also the language, regardless of the implementation of the language, the language itself does not um, lend itself to the type of detail-oriented precision that facilitates that kind of thinking. Therefore, you use a different language, right? Right tool for the right job. Okay, so here's the producer runnable. And you can see, it, I declare that it has a reference to the payload. Oh, here's the producer ID and the messages size, reference payload, and also it gets a handle to the running count, right? It gets those things passed in as part of its constructor. It just saves them, that's all. And then when it hit run, what I'm doing is, um, Actually, I'm gonna wait on that. I'm gonna go down here. I'm going to get a monitor on the running count, and then I'm gonna decrement it, and then I'm gonna hit notify. So that, that closes the loop. That closes the loop on this stuff. Now, what is all of this ceremony for putting stuff in the queue? I need to, well, one thing that's annoying, because it's Java, I need to instantiate a payload, right? So I instantiate the payload, great. And I take that payload and I am going to get a monitor on the payload. Now the queue, uh, I shouldn't say the queue. The queue interface is being backed by a concrete object of class linked list. So linked list is not thread safe. What does it mean for something to be thread safe? It means that there are, you can't um, rely on individual method calls on that object to be non-interruptible. That's really all it is. And I see a question. Yes, there is, Lynn. Um, that's actually really key. When you pass an int in Java, you pass by value. So decrementing it won't report back to whoever passed it in. I have to make it an object. Arrays are objects. So I make an array of size one in order to um, be able to pass by reference rather than pass by value. Does that make sense? Okay. So, all right. Um, we have this monitor that's acquired on the payload queue. I'm going to try to add, I'm, it may result in an illegal state exception. What is the illegal state exception? The illegal state exception arises when the queue is full. Can you use integer the box primitive? No, you cannot. Inter the box primitives are still immutable by design. It's actually not meant to be a reference reference. Like when you, um, you can't, okay, yeah, okay. So, yeah, the, di the difference between reference and value philosophically is a great topic. <laughs> um, okay, so you have this um, a legal state exception, which arises when the queue is full, because we have to remember that, hey, there are times in which the um, you know, we don't have limited resources, maybe the queue gets full. The real life analog at a post office is the back room is full. I can't take your package, right? 
If the back room is my queue, queue is full. So here I have the producer wait. But in real life, what I would probably do is come back and say like, oh, hey, the queue is full. I can't take your package. Here's your package back. I re actually actively reject it, right? So at least you give the person requesting the service choice. So much of this, um, of these design patterns, um, when it comes to services and concurrency, they're about guaranteeing that your user has um, alternatives. If you're full up, maybe the user can go somewhere else. It's better than just taking the package and holding on to it, right? Okay, so here though, simple example, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call wait here. I'm gonna wait until someone tells me that the queue is drained. Or, or at least like some stuff has been taken out of it. Now, when I add, after I add, I'm going to notify all. Who am I notifying? I'm notifying everyone who waits on this, right? Now, who will call notify on this queue? Well, who has access to the queue? All the producers and all the consumers. So now here's a channel of communication between the two sides. The producers can put something in the queue one at a time, right? The consumers can take stuff off the queue one at a time. When the queue is full up, the producer is going to wait, which means that the consumer, it's going to wait for the consumer to say like, hey, I just took one, so it's not full anymore and you should try again, right? The other scenario is the consumer tries to take from the queue and it's empty. So it waits. And it's going to wait for a producer to come in and say, hey, I just put something in the queue. And that's where this notify is really intended for. Now, who will get this notify? Other producers who are waiting will also get this notify. So you have to be really careful that maybe the notify isn't simply for the case where something has been taken out. It could be for the case where something was just added, right? And in that case, you have to make sure that the behavior is correct. And here the behavior is correct because it's going to go and continue and try again. And that try will, if it's still an ISE, an illegal state exception, it's gonna freeze right here. So it's safe, it's fine. So this is how the producer works. We also have the consumer. The consumer instantiates, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's, the consumer is a little more complicated. So here's an infinite loop. Inside this infinite loop, first it's going to check to see like, hey, is the, um, is the uh, producer done? or are all the producers done? If all the producers done and the queue is empty, break. Break out and it's going to finish. Both these conditions have to be true, right? Okay. And then we have this, we'll synchronize on the payload, we'll try to do a remove, if there's a no such element exception, queue is empty, I'm gonna wait, just like I said, right? Otherwise, it took something out, it's gonna call notify all in case there are any producers that are waiting on a full queue. And that's it. So that's the solution when we have something like monitors. And in Java, monitors are the way that you do um, coordinated uh, access to resources. Now, I wanna go back to the Python really quickly and point out, actually, no, before I do that, any questions on this Java or any questions at, at all right now?
All right. So um, here's the Python. You'll notice here that I have this thing called a, a lock, a print lock. What is a lock? A lock is an implementation of something called mutual exclusion. Mutual exclusion, aka locks. The notion of a critical section. A critical section is a sequence of operations that acts as a shared resource, right? And the idea is that when one worker is in a critical section for a shared resource, no other worker may be in any critical section for that same resource. That's a lock. Or it's implemented with locks. Um, there's lots of, there's issues with all of these, by the way, like the, you know, what issues with locks, prone to deadlocks, resource starvation, cannot transfer resource ownership. There's issues with all of these. Concurrent programming is hard as hell. It's hard as hell. Um, but when we have, let me show you the um, actual use of this lock. I have this print lock and here, I can say with print lock, I'm going to print to the console. You may not know this about Python as a standard. Python as a standard, when you call print, it's not thread safe. It's not guaranteed thread safe. You can get interleaved text in the console. Now, Typically, you don't get interleaved text in the console because most Python actual implementations, C Python, for instance, on most operating systems and architectures, it is thread safe. They went ahead and made it thread safe, even though the language standard library um, documentation does not call for it. They went ahead and did it just because it's so common. There's a performance hit for that, by the way. So I'm going to pretend here that, you know, Python 3.8.2, C Python on Linux in whatever architecture is hosted on Repl.it is not um, thread safe. It probably actually is. It happens to be thread safe, but it's not guaranteed to be, right? I'm going to pretend it isn't. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call with, which is, um, is, is everyone, um, is everyone familiar with what with is in Python? What that actually does? All right, I'll say a few words on it. So when you call with on an object, all that happens is as you enter this section, there's a double underscore enter method on this um, object. In this case, that double underscore method is going to acquire the lock. And then you're guaranteed when you exit that with block, doesn't matter how you exit, maybe you return out of it. Maybe you throw an exception and it's uncaught, right? However you exit that with block, it's guaranteed that you're going to call a double underscore exit method on this object. So this guarantees that you can't accidentally leave the lock locked when you're done with it. When you're done with it, it's going to unlock by definition, right? So context managers are a really um, handy way of um, guaranteeing that that's specific to Python. Every language that has this feature implements it differently and they look very different. Actually, it looks different in Elm. It looks different. It looks different in everything, right? Um, but in Python, this is what it looks like with something colon. All right, with this print lock, I'm going to guarantee that I'm going to grab the lock. And also, the lock, the act of grabbing the lock, is blocking. So if someone else tries to grab the print lock, so the print lock corresponds. The, it's it's like I'm calling synchronize on the console, right? That's what I'm guarding is the console because I don't want interleaved text in the console. So whenever I access the console, I'm going to acquire this lock. So with print lock, I'm then, I'm then going to call print. 
Okay. Um, that is mutual exclusion, basically. You try to, this, whatever is in the width block is what I'm calling my critical section. This is my critical section of code. And you can see this is also a critical section of code on the same object, which is why I'm guarding it with the same lock. Right? And the idea is if someone has this lock and I try to get in, I'm going to just wait. I can't not wait. There is no come back later. There are schemes for that, lock schemes for that. Like I try to acquire and then if I can't acquire it, I go do something else. So I don't just like sit there mindlessly, right? And waste my time, waste my computing resources. But in this case, I am just going to waste my computing resources and this is gonna block. But what it means is that when I'm blocked, when the block clears, I'm going to proceed. So there's no way of stopping me either. There's no way to say like, oh, hey, conditions changed, changed my mind. So this is a very naive solution, but this is mutual exclusion. You can see the mutual exclusion also on the Java side because I have here all of the print with a monitor. Monitors include inside of themselves mutual exclusion. When you synchronize on something, you're also doing a mutex. The difference between a mutual exclusion and a monitor is that the monitor has some extra features. Those features are notify. And where'd the wait go? Yeah, notify and wait. The fact that you can notify and wait. Because what happens when you, um, in a mutex, when you don't have notify and wait, that um, thread just sits there and spins. And it's actually a waste of CPU. It literally is, it's called a spin lock. Okay, any questions at this point? All right, cool. So I am going to pull up the third one of these. This is Golang. Da, da, da. I'm gonna run this. And um, you can see how fast that was, holy crap. Um, so here's Golang. Yeah, it looks like a programming language, right? The only, <laughs> the only um, real differences are these weird, and we'll talk about this. What is this Chan with an arrow going into it? What is Chan with an arrow coming out of it? Right? But it looks kind of Python-y, almost, kind of. Funk main, right? I create a logger so that I have access to standard out so that I can print to the console, great. And um, what I'm doing, I'll skip down here to line uh, 44. So what I'm doing is I'm, I have a for loop that actually says like, hey, for all of the producers that I've allocated, right? Classic for loop. I'm going to call produce, but I'm going to call produce as a go routine, which is not a thread. It is, but it isn't. And this is where um, the words between um, the science side and the philosophy side get really convoluted. So everything on the philosophy side is a process. But on the science side, when you talk about operating systems, you can't use the word process because the people who designed Unix and then later Windows, they took the word <laughs> and they made it mean something very specific, right? 
And so now you have to come up with other words like threads and go routines and all that. So those are all implementation specific, but a go routine is a process, a computer science process. It's a computer science process that is implemented inside of the go runtime rather than being delegated to the operating system. Why? Because um, it was an observation that basically said like, hey, operating system threads are really resource heavy. They're really resource heavy. We can do a better job in user space. And so Go routines are implemented in user space. They implemented their own scheduler. And now you have this wonderful piece of machinery that can have thousands of Go routines running at once. You cannot have thousands of threads in a Python program or a Java program or whatever. It would choke it. They're way too heavy. But you can have thousands of Go routines, right? Because the designers and the implementers of the Golang language decided, yeah, we're not gonna use what the oper operating system gave us. We can do better. So that's all a Go routine is. It's a thread, quote unquote, just not an operating system thread. All right, so, and the, the syntax is really nice in Golang because it's built for this. Golang is built for the type of backend, fault tolerant, resilient, you know, highly efficient systems that um, I mentioned, right? It's built for that. And therefore, they have a lot of syntax built into the language that makes the common things for that task easy. If you are not building those kinds of systems, do not use Golang. It is a pain in the butt to use. I would only bother using Golang because I need the fault tolerance. <laughs> because it is not fun. <laughs> it is not a fun language. In the way that Python is more fun, in the way that Clojure is really fun. I love Clojure, right? So here I have what looks like a regular function call, but the fact that I call go right before it means that I create it as a go routine and submit it to the scheduler. I'm not going to run it right away. So it's a regular function call. So you know how in uh, Python and also in Java, I had to create a runnable object. Uh, excuse me. In Python, it's a callable object. In Java, it's a runnable object, right? I have to create a callable or a runnable in order to wrap in a thread and then call start on it. Here, I don't have to do that. I just have a regular function call. And then I just prepend it with go and boom, done. Great. They gave me some syntax to do this common thing. Um, this produce, so what, what am I passing in here? The producer ID, the producer message count, this thing called the channel. So what is the channel, this, this CH? The channel is my queue. There is, built in first class support in Golang for queues. You can almost, um, it's almost like Golang is built around the producer consumer design pattern. Almost like, it basically is. So much of Golang is tuned for doing producer consumer. So, and it's tortured, right? Because people, um, this producer consumer primitive, it's, it's enabled in the language as a primitive. It becomes a hammer to solve other unrelated problems, which is really weird and, and oddly fascinating. What situations is Golang used? Like I said, um, the, when you are building backend systems that have to be really efficient, really fault tolerant, and really resilient, you ideally then never crash. Yeah, but never crash at large, large scale. Like we're talking like Reddit scale, Facebook scale. Okay, so I'm going to call this thing called make, 
which I'm not going to get into the go line specifics of like, when do you have to make, when do you, whatever. There's certain, there's certain types that you have to make. Chan is one of them. So I'm actually making a Chan payload. So this chain is going to hold payloads and it has an, an uh, buffer size of 16. So this queue has 16 slots in it, right? Um, which means it can get full pretty quickly, but we'll see what happens. Um, I take this queue and I pass it into produce. I also pass in this thing called wait group. So you, you saw how I had to go out of my way to make this weird thing of like a, um, a one element array of an int for the running producers. Yeah, well, okay, there's a built-in for that. It's a wait group. In the wait group, by the way, that one element array has an actual corresponding computer science title when, when surrounded with a, a few better facilities in syntax. That one element array, that, where is it? That is a semaphore. And these three are the fundamental building blocks of concurrency. Concurrency that does not use um, something along the lines of MVCC. That's a whole different family of concurrency. This family of concurrency where you're trying to um, avoid stepping on each other's toes in the first place. Semaphore is the last one. So what does the semaphore do? Well, I take this weight group and you can see I initialize the weight group by saying how many producers there are. And I'm going to um, hand a handle to this weight group over to the producer. I then call weight group produce dot weight. That's the same as you know that huge block of um, code around um, waiting for decrements and all of that stuff. That's it, that's one line. I'm waiting for zero. So now Golang has given me a facility for doing that common thing, built into the language. Oh. Yeah, so you can see I wait for all the producers to finish. Okay. And then I wait for, I do a thing. We'll go into what that thing is, but I wait for all the consumers to finish and then I'm done. So the consumers um, signal that they're done too, right? Now this produce, I really love this feature of Golang. You see this defer call? I love this defer call. Defer means that I'm calling it at the beginning, but when you exit this scope, then do it. So that, you can see I'm printing the end message, but I do that before I print the start message. It's because I'm basically saying like, hey, when this function exits, do these things. So you remember how I said context manager, right? Um, Python solution is use with syntax and then with the with syntax, you have an object and that object has a double underscore enter and a double underscore exit and it's guaranteed that those things are called great. This is the context manager for uh, Golang where defer is the exit. I stack it into the exit here and there is no with construct, but it accomplishes the same thing. It's kind of beautiful. The first time I saw this, I was like, oh, why didn't I think of that? That's really nice. <laughs> it's much nicer to work with. The only um, problem with this is that uh, you have to nail it to a scope. So 
a funk declaration is a scope, it's a lexical scope, right? So you can do it with that. Whereas in Python, it's arbitrary. Anywhere, if you want to insert that scope, you just do with blah, 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 somewhere. And you're guaranteed. Okay, so you can see that I print the start, I consume from the channel this uh, payload object, or not consume, I, I put, put the payload into the, the channel. What happens, what happens when the channel is full? I block. It's built into the language that that's going to happen. So I'm just going to wait, which is fine because the scheduler is smart enough for a Go routine, unlike a thread, a POSIX thread. For a Go routine, it's going to be really lightweight. It's just going to say like, okay, I'll just freeze you and throw you to the side and I'll know. It, it handles all of the stuff that we were manually doing in Java with the semaphore. Yeah. Oh, the producer consumer drive. Oh yeah, you have to go up one level. I'm sorry. It's up. Yeah, it's weird. Because I think I put a link to the producer consumer, but the concurrency is actually outside of it. Okay, Sorry. can I just share the link to the file in the chat? Okay, cool. And so, and then these deferred calls happen, right? This deferred done, it actually is last first. So deferred done goes first and it calls on the wait group done. That's the decrement. And it's safe. There's no synchronization needed. We just, it, it's done safely. And then it prints, right? And which means this wait is going to do the right thing. Now, the other thing is, you look at the consume and I do this for payload in range of CH. What the hell is range? This is a beautiful language feature of Golang. Um, it's, it's great for this purpose. When I range on a channel, I'm going to like give you elements from the channel, right? As iterate over the channel as, as a list, right? And um, I'm gonna give you these things. And what happens? Well, if it's empty, I'm going to block. I'm going to stop giving you stuff. So how do I distinguish between empty and I know this thing is completely done? How do I distinguish between the queue is done and the queue is empty? Golang gives us a facility. It's called close. What does close do? Close marks the channel is as uh, done. So at this point, it's going to range until it's empty and closed. And then you exit. It is in order to, um, so implementing this is pretty straightforward, um, but the, if you're a type theorist like me, if you're a Haskeller, right? If you're a type theorist, it's actually really fascinating to um, think about, well, it's almost like you're putting a close object into the channel. And the moment, right, the uh, close object is hit, assuming that there's no other objects in the channel, right, then you're done. From a type theory perspective, that requires this understanding of like, oh, maybe the type is a union of two things. I'm not gonna get too far into that. But something to think about if you're a type person, especially if you're someone who is a Haskeller or, or even a Scala person, right? Something to think about the versatility of that. So, okay. So this close only happens when all of the producers are done, 
once the producers are done, I'm going to call close on this, which then signals that, hey, I'm going to range until everything is consumed and it's closed. Okay, it's closed. Boom, I'm done. And then at that point, this deferred weight group dot done, that deferred weight group dot, dot done gets executed and the weight group consume gets decremented, right? When they're all decremented to zero, this unblocks and we're done. And you can see this code is, of course, a lot shorter than the, the Java code because it has a lot of built in language features for um, this kind of uh, programming. Because so much of, um, I mean, just to give you some, some idea, right? Like, if you've ever heard of the programming language Erlang, <clears throat> Erlang is built around the notion of message passing. Erlang is like, it's built around the notion of message passing. You could think of it as like an entire programming language that is built around producer, consumer, and queues. They do everything that way. Okay. Um, any questions on this code? No? Okay. Any questions overall? Because that's all I got. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Oh, is there a thing? Cool. So I'm going to um, issue a call first. I'm going to issue a call for uh, volunteers. Um, doing one of these. Um, so I, I did an event series for Women Who Code SF um, a few years ago. I totally burnt out on it. My um, co-host and I totally burnt out on it. Um, and was making kind of original content with slides and everything. It was like way too much. From, for one person. Um, I was the one driving the content. Um, so yeah, for one person. And um, I would like uh, to see if there's any interest in making this sustainable. Because this is the kind of um, content that I personally wish that I saw more of um over the years right um from you know organizations like women who Co code uh women ds or you know things like that right like um and so if anyone would be interested in um helping out with creating this kind of content and helping the volunteer technically organizing all the, you know all the things um please uh send your um contact information to um, either myself or Monica or Arteta. Um, and yeah, I will say that if, if for whatever reason you find like this kind of stuff intimidating, um, I would be on hand to support the generation of the content, right? Like it, it would be like me, you know, training up or something if that makes sense. All right. All right, if there's no other questions, I'm going to uh, close the meeting unless um, anyone wants to do anything else. I'm gonna stop the recording. This was great. Thank you very much. Thank you.